last couple of lectures we were discussing about uh, friction or the Coulomb's law of friction which describes the uh, friction between uh, two solid surfaces. To, in this lecture our topic is a drag force which represents the friction between a solid and a fluid. So, let us start with a story. So, you might have heard about this story that uh, the famous physicist Galileo performed this experiment where he dropped two cannonballs from the leaning tower of Pisa to show one's big one small to show that they both have the same acceleration. It is not clear whether this story actually is true, I mean this experiment ever happened, most probably no. But uh, let us say if we take a cannonball and a feather from experience, we definitely know that it does not happen. That is the feather and the cannonball both dropped from the same height at the same time with 0 initial velocity let us say, the cannonball will drop further and the feather will uh, fall later. So, why does it happen? The point is that we know that the acceleration due to gravity for both of them are same g, small g. So, they should be falling together. In fact, this will be true if we can perform this experiment of dropping a feather and a cannonball together in vacuum. So, here is a link I provide to a video that actually very interesting and fascinating video that actually does this experiment in a vacuum chamber and dramatically show that indeed uh, they fall together. So, I invite you to take a look at this video. But in normal situations in real life, we live inside a fluid that is we are surrounded by air and this air produces some friction. So, we are always feeling this frictional force due to air and this frictional force uh, is more on the feather because of its higher surface area compared to a cannonball which is more compact. Hence, the uh, net acceleration due to the combined force of the drag and the weight of acceleration I mean the force due to at, um, earth is more uh, for the cannonball versus the feather. But if you can take the air out then you will see a very different thing which is so take a look at this video. So, the question is then that is this drag force due to air is significant? When can we expect a drag to be significant? This is a very important question if you want to build correct physical intuition and uh, want to solve mechanics problem correctly. The answer actually depends, it is very interesting thing that the answer actually depends on the size of the dropped object. For example, if we fail from a height uh, often it is fatal to us humans, but from the same height if you drop a, uh, if a cat falls which is a much smaller size it most of the time survives. So, there is a very another very interesting video I put the link here which asked this somewhat uh, interesting question that what happens if we throw an elephant from a skyscraper. So, this basically performs a thought experiment where if you drop an object of different size starting from the size of an elephant down to a size of an ant from a skyscraper, then uh, whether this is going to survive or not the fall. The overall point is that as the size of the object gets smaller, its weight mg gets smaller. So, the drag force becomes more significant compared to the weight. So, that is why whether the drag is significant or not, the answer depends on whether this force is significant or not compared to the weight of the object. 
For example, a crucial the the so let me give you an example of where we expect drag is really important is that if you take a small object such as a raindrop. Now, you know that raindrop falls from a very high uh, part of the sky let us say from a cloud which is often more than a kilometer high. Now, if you ignore the drag force in this case, then you expect the resultant velocity of a raindrop will be so high that if a raindrop hits us, we will it is like a bullet hitting us and we will immediately get killed. But we know that that does not happen and in fact raindrops fall with a constant speed and that is because the drag force in this case is significant and it cancels the, uh, the attraction due to earth so that the overall force on the raindrop can be 0. So, then it leads to a question naturally. So, raindrop is an example of a projectile motion problem. So, in your high school perhaps you have studied projects projectile motion problem, but in a very idealized situation where you have only considered the gravity as the only force determine the motion of the projectile. But then in real life if you deal with actual projectile, then you have to answer this question can we ignore the drag force on the projectile motion problem or not. So, we are going to address this question in the course of uh, in the uh, in the subsequent lectures. So, before to analyze this problem what we need is uh, some expression for the drag force. So, then the question is what factors actually determine the drag force. Let us call the drag force on our objects is F d, d denotes the drag. So, this is drag. So, here there is no theoretical way. So, we have to do experiments and uh, build our experience and knowledge. And from experience we know that it is more difficult to move through water than through air. What does it mean? It means the drag force is higher for higher density of the fluid through which the solid is moving. Second thing, so density is a factor. Second thing that we know that if you are going at a if you are standing still versus if you are going at a higher speed for example, in a moving train if you are standing on the uh, in near the sitting on the in the window side, air hits us more forcefully when we are going at higher speed. So, this means the drag force is higher for higher velocity of the object moving through. Then the third factor is that the flatter object like a feather face more drag force significantly more drag force than a more compact object like a round object like a cannonball of the same mass. So, this translates to the fact that drag force. Uh, so, the more the cross section of the object higher is the drag force. So, the cross sectional area of the object. So, cross sectional area means suppose this is some object and this is moving through air in this orientation. Then the cross section, so it may have some surface area, but what matters is the if you do a cut of this object perpendicular to the direction of velocity, then what is the area of that cut? That is the cross section. For example, in this way, in this case, this is the cut and this is the cross section. But if the if we look at this way, then you can see that the cross section covers the entire area. So the drag force, if the if this object moves in this direction, this way, then the drag force will be higher. And finally, we know that the drag force increases with the property called viscosity of the fluid. So these are the factors that we expect should determine the drag force. Now, before we go to some write down some formula, you at this point normally uh, what you usually do is to write down the formula and memorize the formula. Instead of that, let me sort of emphasize on the physical picture of what is going on about the drag force. What happens when a solid object moves through a fluid? So, here is a schematic. Let us say this disk represents the cross section A of an object which is moving through this blue uh, fluid uh, with a velocity v. So, let us imagine 
that initially the fluid is at rest. So, there are two things that happens. First thing, suppose the fluid is at rest initially, then as this object starts to move, suppose you immerse it at rest and then it starts to move, then it drags the fluid which is in contact with the object with itself with a velocity v. So, this is the drag. So, it creates the fluid surrounding the object starts to move. which means in other words that at initially the kinetic energy of the fluid was 0 at initially and then when the object starts to move the kinetic energy of the fluid is no longer 0. And where is this kinetic energy is coming from? It is coming from the object. So, if the object is moving through the fluid, this its if there are no other forces involved, then its velocity will gradually slow down. It will gradually slow down and it will eventually stop. This is the due to the friction due to the fluid on the object. So, the kinetic energy of the object will convert, will go into the fluid surrounding it. So, it will convert to drag the create kinetic energy, create motion in the fluid which is in contact with the uh, with the object. So, this is the first thing. So, this is the drag. At the same time, so then it transfers. So, transfer of K e kinetic energy from solid to fluid. This is the first step. But then what happens to that moving fluid? So, if the fluid surrounding it starts to move, then imagine there are different layers in the fluid, then that fluid it starts will start to drag the near near the layer of fluid in contact with it with itself. And then there will be a friction between these two fluid layers. And as we know from Newton's law of viscosity that if the fluid is simple fluid or which are called Newtonian fluids. So, this so the this liquid the, this layer let us say this layer fluid layer 1, 2, 3 etcetera. So, this layer 1 will uh, exert a tangential force on layer 2 and similarly layer 2 will exert a tangential force on layer 3 uh, layer 3 and so on so forth and this force will sort of because of this force this force will be proportional to the uh, but the velocity of this layer 2 will be little less compared to layer 1 velocity of layer 3 will be little less compared to layer 2 because of the in friction between the fluid layers so there will be a velocity gradient in the direction which is perpendicular to the velocity of the object moving. And hence gradually, so this all the fluid member was originally at rest, but now they, are, they will start moving and hence what we will see is that as the object moves from this position to this position, the fluid gets disturbed. So, the fluid in contact with the object gets dragged and then starts to move and then so there is a net flow of momentum from in the perpendicular direction so that the kinetic energy gained by this fluid in contact with the object is gradually transferred in through the fluid in the direction normal to the velocity of the solid object and this is of course true in both direction so it happens in both directions. So, the second part is a loss mechanism 
by which due to viscosity of fluid by which this K e of fluid is dissipated in the fluid which means it gradually gets lost in the fluid in the perpendicular direction. So, these are the two process physical processes that are that happens when a solid object is moving through a fluid and both of these uh, processes is imp may be important. So, now to derive the expression so, we are not, we will take a simple root that is mathematically simple and we will sort of eliminate all the main details. So, we are going to use a um, something called the concept of dimensional analysis and making a, we are going to make a dimensionless quantity to sort of get at the expression for drag force. So, what we have seen so far that the force, the drag force is proportional to rho and density of the fluid is proportional to the area of cross section of the object and it is proportional to velocity, but is it proportional to velocity linearly or square or cube or what that we do not know. So, let us say that it is proportional to some power of velocity. Then we can combine them to say that the track force is proportional to this part, this three quantities in this particular combination. And we demand take the ratio and we say that this ratio is dimensionless, which is a property of liquid, it varies from liquid to liquid and it is it's, it's basically uh, yeah, it depends on the nature of the solid object and the liquid, but it does not depend on all these six factors which are already taken care of. This is called the drag coefficient or C d. Now, from this by now we can do dimensional analysis to determine what is the power of V. So, if this is dimensionless that means this the product rho times a times v to the alpha must have the same dimension as force. So, what is the dimension of force? So, force has dimension is mass times acceleration. So, m uh, mass line length time d to the power minus 2. Now, density has a dimension. So, this is the f d. So, now we are going to look at the dimension of density it has a dimension of mass by volume, area has a dimension of uh, length square and V to the alpha has a dimension of L to the alpha by T to the alpha. So, the product has a dimension M by L cube times L square times L to the alpha times T to the alpha. Now, if we compare the dimension of F d and the dimension of this product, we immediately see that alpha is 2. So, this is a crucial point that the drag force is proportional to rho a v square from dimensional analysis. So, this is proportional to v square. So, this is the first part which sort of transfer of kinetic energy from the solid object to the liquid in contact with the solid. But you see that we are missing one factor which is the viscosity. So, we need to know now the second aspect of the physical process which is the loss or loss of momentum from the surrounding the liquid that is in contact with the fluid to the uh, other areas of the liquid other regions of the liquid further away from the solid object. Now, here this part as we know that 
this force that the shear force which is the internal friction. So, remember that we had this different imaginary layers of liquid. So, which exerts force uh, tangential force in the direction of uh, in the direction in which the object is moving, but the different directions has a different velocity, different layers have different velocity. Now, how much is the shear force? So, in the simple case of a Newtonian liquid, this is given by the Newton's law of viscosity, which says that this force is proportional to the area of the tangential area times the gradient of the velocity. So, let us say this is the x direction and this is the y direction. So, the object is moving in x direction. So, then its velocity is has an x component and but the gradient is in the perpendicular direction. Hence, you changing with the derivative is with respect to y. Now, this constant of proportionality I am going to write it instead of the customary way of writing eta, I am going to use the symbol nu which represents the kinematic viscosity. It is a material parameter representing the mechanism of energy loss due to the flow of momentum in the direction perpendicular to the motion of the object. So, this nu times a t, so t for tangential times dv x by dy. Now, again let us say that what is the dimension of nu? Now, the dimension of nu can be found from looking at this expression. So, the dimension of the shear force is again m l t minus 2 and the dimension of nu rho, rho is the density of the liquid. So, this is traditionally called viscosity. So, which means that nu is uh, the viscosity divided by the density of the liquid. So, rho times a some area t a tangential area times velocity gradient. So, this is the dimension of nu times the dimension of density times dimension of the area times the dimension of um, the velocity which is L by t times the dimension of length. So, we see that and this should have the dimension of force. So, we see from this equation uh, by solving the dimension that um, so this gets cancelled. So, this is L. So, this mass gets cancelled. So, we have the nu times the 1 by L t is equal to L by t square. That means, dimension of nu is L square by t. So, the kinematic viscosity is some quantity which represents a material parameter with a dimension L square by t, which we can also write as L times L by t. So, then the question is that how we now we want to make a combination of a dimensionless quantity that represents the effect of the vis this viscous mechanism, viscous loss, the viscosity. So, we can see from here that if I make a combination something like some velocity times some length, let us say which represents the size of the object and traditional uh, and divided by nu. So, this is a quantity you can verify that it must be dimensionless and this quantity is called the Reynolds number. So, here this d represents some length scale, some linear size, linear dimension of the object. So, let us say the diameter of the object. Now, the point is that we have now four quantities and so and from which we have come, we have found two dimensionless parameters. One is the drag, drag coefficient which is given by this expression and the other is the Reynolds number which is given by 
the velocity times d divided by nu. So, from experiment it turns out that these two parameters, so they so the importance of forming dimensionless parameter which is a very standard uh, way of analyzing problem in fluid mechanics is that now we know what are the para control factors in the problem and then this single, so and we know that there are there could be different infinite number of combinations of density, area, velocity of the object, but what matters is this particular combination. So, this dimensionless parameter sort of gives you the, the, the real control parameter that determines the mechanical properties of the motion. Now, it turns out that these two parameters are not independent of each other, they are not independent, yeah. So, this we can write express this drag coefficient as a function of the second parameter that is the Reynolds number. Now, we do not of course know what is exactly the function is, but here we sort of get a insight by looking at extreme cases or the limiting cases. So, first one limiting case is when this kinematic viscosity tends to 0, which means the liquid is almost free of friction. So, this is a frictionless condition. So, uh, the, there is no, uh, uh, the viscosity of the liquid is very, very less, almost you can ignore the viscosity. So, in this case, you expect if the viscosity is very, you can ignore the viscosity, then you expect that this drag force to be independent of viscosity. In other words, this drag coefficient, which is by the way a constant of proportionality from our uh, uh, this uh, sorry this analysis. So, this C d must be a constant, then it follows that this F t is proportional to rho a times v square. Whereas, let us take the other extreme case where this nu is very high. So, this is a case if nu is very less, this is a case where the Reynolds number which is inversely proportional to nu is very large compared to 1. And the other case where nu is very high that is the Reynolds number is very small compared to 1. Now, in this case our experiment shows that we expect that this, this drag force is proportional to nu. Now, then what kind of function, the simplest function that we can think of for which this happens is that the C d is proportional to just 1 by R d. In other words, the drag force divided by rho a times v square is proportional to nu by v times d, which means the drag force is proportional to nu times rho times a by d times v square by v. So, v square is cancelled with this v. So, you just have 1 v. So, in this case this a by d, a represents some the cross sectional area and d represents some let us say linear dimension. So, this traditionally we can represent it by a radius of the object, cross sectional radius of the object and this nu times rho is called the viscosity uh, of the liquid. So, in that case the drag force becomes linearly proportional to the velocity. So, this is the correct way to think about the velocity dependence of the drag force that it is not that the small velocity means that the drag force is proportional to the velocity which is usually many textbooks describe in that way. Small velocity means drag force is proportional to velocity and large velocity means drag force is proportional to velocity square. But the experiments show it is not the velocity only, only control factor, the drag force is determined by all these other factors, the density and the cross sectional area and velocity and kinetic viscosity.
So, what is the controlling factor is the Reynolds number. So, when the Reynolds number is small, then the drag force is proportional to the velocity 1 that is the correct statement. And when the Reynolds number is high, then the drag force is proportional to velocity square. And these are the two limiting case uh, that is the simple, simple limiting case. And then if you, so note that I have written a proportionality. If you replace, then you get some constant. And this constant, to calculate this constant, you really need to solve the Newton's law of motion starting from Newton's second law for the fluid and the object uh, in, uh, in, in, in detail, which is a mathematically complicated for problem and beyond the scope of this course. But it turns out this constant is just a number like 6 pi or 4 pi and it slightly depends on what is called the boundary condition. But apart from this factor of 6 pi or 4 pi, our dimensional analysis can actually capture the correct dependence on velocity and the size of the object. And this by the way is called the Stokes law of viscosity. In the next lecture, so now we have some expression to summarize what we have today is that we learned how that what is the uh, when the drag force is significant and second what is the form of the drag force how it depends on velocity of the moving object uh, and we saw that there are two extreme limiting cases one which where the Reynolds number is small in that case the drag force is given by the Stokes law uh, expression uh, or, or so it is proportional to linear lean velocity to velocity and proportional to the viscosity. So, it is determined by the viscosity and in the other case where the uh, Reynolds number is high, then it is proportional to V square. And you have to remember the correct physical picture that there are two mechanisms involved in this case. One is a transfer of energy from solid object to the liquid and then the transfer of energy from the liquid to far away region of the liquid. So, in the next lecture, we are going to illustrate these ideas with worked out examples. Thank you.